Hello and welcome to The Great Movie Show. I'm Adam, your host for this episode. I'm joined as ever by my co-hosts, Lloyd and Dave. Hello. This week's episode is entitled, Back Off Man, I'm a Scientist, because we're, of course, looking at Ghostbusters. And to clarify, we're looking at Ghostbusters from 1984, not the 2016 film of the same name. To add more confusion, we can't refer to the first movie as the real Ghostbusters, as that was a successful spin-off, which ran over seven seasons from 1986. Ironically, they had to add the real part following a dispute with Filmation, who produced coincidentally in 1986 an animated series called Ghostbusters, which they were allowed to do as it was based on their 1975 live action television show, The Ghostbusters. So to be clear, Ghostbusters is not to be confused with the remake Ghostbusters, the animated series Ghostbusters, the renamed animated series Ghostbusters, the TV show The Ghostbusters, or the animated The Real Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters was a 1984 hit, grossing more than $225 million at the box office in the US alone. It reached that rare feat of being a commercially successful comedy, a cult classic, and nominated for an Oscar. Well, two, actually. Ghostbusters brought together the talents of Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Bill Murray, under the tutelage of Ivan Reitman. It spawned a commercially successful sequel, imaginatively titled Ghostbusters 2, in 1989, and rumours of a third movie began circling around board studio lots and Hollywood cafes for years, but never materialised. The closest it came to being realised appears to be in 1999, a purchase by IGN of a script for Ghostbusters 3, Hellbent, although nothing came to pass. The sad death of Harold Ramis on the 24th of February 2014 appeared to lay rest that notion. However, there was a 2016 remake, and of course, we're now waiting for the Ivan Reitman's son, Jason Reitman, to release his Ghostbusters Afterlife, with a story that poignantly appears to focus on the loss of Ramus's character Egon, and also stars the never-aging Paul Rudd, along with child superstars Finn Wolfhart and McKenna Grace. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Dave, are you excited as I am about uh, doing uh, Ghostbusters? As excited I as hard. I was last week doing I can hardly yours? contain myself, but, but I'll try. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> No more excitement? <laughs> That's it. It'll come out in due course. What's going on? Has Adam got glitchy Wi-Fi again? I don't know. Keeps on dropping out. This is why we have a technical rehearsal <laughs> half an hour before recording. <laughs> Every week. Every but you week don't turn up to, Adam, and then you spend the first half an hour recording <laughs> trying to tweak your microphone that you don't know how to turn on. <laughs> Oh, he's back. back. Oh, there you are. But you've been tied in the garage. <laughs> no, I've just been putting oh, on an you, outfit. <laughs> You're a ghost bus. <laughs> Very nice. Where's he gone? <laughs> <laughs> Think I've been nobbled by ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> like Ray was. <laughs> yeah, that's that's well. that. Depends. What do nah. you mean by nobbled? <laughs> <laughs> what I thought I'd start with is to uh, to ask Dave um, if you had to describe the plot in approximately thirty seconds, what would you say? Um, it's a movie about three um, failed academics getting kicked out of university, going to business for themselves, uh, catching ghosts, which just happens to coincide with a huge kind of surge in paranormal activity in New York City, uh, and they end up saving the world. Um, it's interesting, like talking about doing a, a synopsis or a, a plot description in 30 seconds and then expanding upon it. Apparently, Ivan Reitman had a good relationship with Columbia Pictures executives because of Stripes, which he had directed previously. And apparently he said to, uh, I think it was studio head Frank Price, um, ghost janitors in New York. That was it. That was his entire pitch. Yeah. Um, and uh, Price was intrigued and decided to, to run with it and, and start marketing it. In fact, I think um, adjusted for inflation, it might still be Columbia Pictures' most commercially successful film of all time. When we talk about um, the plot and what works and what doesn't, I'm sure there's probably some gaffes that we can deal with in some ways. But Lloyd, what would be your favorite scene or favorite moment? Or the too many to, to choose from? Uh, my favourite moment is repeated a number of times, and it makes me laugh every single time. 
and it's whenever Lewis Tully comes out of his room, he comes out of his apartment <laughs> to, to accost Dana Barrett, and he just turns around every time, even when he's got the party going on, and he's locked out his apartment, and it happens about three, four times, and every time it's brilliant. They are my favourite yeah. parts of the movie, I've, I'd say. I, I've watched it a couple of times over the past couple of days, and exactly the same thing. I am... Um... <laughs> I've I've laughed out loud each time that it's happened, even though you know it's coming. You're just like, come on, go to the door, go to the door. <laughs> How about you, Dave? Uh, well, yeah, Lewis Tully's always up there. Um, another Lewis Tully moment when the when the um, the terror dog breaks out the cupboard door and he goes, "Okay, who brought the dog?" Well, just before actually when it growls. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, loads of Venkman one-liners. Uh, I like the bit in the ballroom, you know, where he's, where he uh, whips the tablecloth. Off, he says, yeah. I've always wanted to do this. The flowers are still standing. Just <laughs> loads of little, yeah. little bits. Like, apparently, he, he basically ad libbed um, a lot of his dialogue, what I understand. Or he did multiple takes. Yeah. He'll have the scripted version and then he'll do a couple of extra takes and just come out with, with other stuff. Quite a lot of the iconic stuff was ad libbed, I believe. Apparently, that was, the, that was true kind of across the board that everybody had a moment or many moments of, of not really sticking to the script. What I love is whether it's true, I don't know. The whole scene with um, Lewis when he's go walking through the room, um, when he's talking about the salmon getting it from Nova Scotia and how he got a, yeah, a discount. Yeah. Apparently, that was all unscripted. Yeah, you improvised. And I, I can't imagine somebody yeah. making something like that up, but it just yeah. was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> he's talking about having to get a, a, a tax write off for his salmon and just yeah. inviting business clients rather than friends. This is, Ted, this is Ted and Annette. Ted's, Ted's yeah. got a, car, a carpet cleaning company in receivership. Yeah. And that's drawing a bonus from, from drawing a pension from a deferred bonus two years ago or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So um, one, of, one of the things I did um, some time ago is I, I started writing, um, well, I thought about writing a, a blog about um, Ghostbusters because I was so interested in it. I didn't really get very far apart from looking at all, you know, the background to the, the, the actors before they arrived at or the director before he arrived at Ghostbusters. And it mm. does seem like Ghostbusters were kind of a, a, a perfect moment for certain people to all come together. Uh, so you obviously got the Saturday Night Live kind of connection um, between a number of the uh, the actors. Um, you think about Dan Aykroyd and, and Bill Murray. They actually hadn't shared any screen time in a movie together before Ghostbusters. Um, they had been in two films at the same time as each other, but just in different scenes. There's one that you might want to find. If you, I think you might be able to find it on YouTube. The um, There's a film called The Rootles, All You Need Is Cash. Oh, uh, the Beatles ripoff. Yeah, it's a Beatles ripoff, yeah. uh, Eric Idle, I think 1978 yeah. or 79. And um, I think Bill Murray plays Murray the K, a disc jockey. He's only in it for, right. for like 30, 40 seconds. Mm. Um and um, and Dan Aykroyd's in it as well. I think he plays a manager. Um, Rumour has it that I think um, they, they gave a copy to John Lennon and he didn't want to give it back. Um, but it, it kind of completely bombed. Um, although it is, quote, it is said to have been um, inspiration for um, This Is Spinal Tap, I think. So, you know, fair play to Eric Idle if, that, if that's what then was spawned. Um, so, yeah, they... they they didn't spend any time together and they they did their own separate projects. And you've got, I think, the Blues Brothers something with um, John Belushi. And we could talk about John Belushi maybe in a, in a bit. Um, yeah. And also you have quite a few good films leading to Bill Murray being in Ghostbusters. I like all his films. Um, you've got, uh, I think, Meatballs to start with, which was Ivan Reitman. I think Howard Ramis, Reitman, Ramis yeah. might have. Yeah. I think Ramis might have written that, helped write that as well. Um, then you've got, I think, Caddyshack might have been before, it was around that time, but Stripes definitely was Harold Ramis and, and um, yeah. Bill Murray, and that was Ivan Reitman, I think, as well. Um, so didn't, it was, wasn't Harold Ramis, didn't Harold Ramis direct Caddyshack? Who did Caddyshack? I think, so. actually, do you know, I think you might be right about um, Ramis. The, there was rumours on set, weren't there, about um, Chevy Chase and Bill Murray didn't get on from their, their time in Saturday Night Live, but they wrote some really classic pieces together. I, I love Caddyshack because I just love the au revoir gopher and the, the stupidity yeah. of Murray's character. I, I think he did because he, it's just come in my, in my mind. Yeah, um, just joking. Harold Ramis. And, your, and Chevy Chase, European Vacation, Harold Ramis directed that. Yeah. You did it. I didn't realise that. Yeah. I love that movie so much. 
but but that's it that's the great thing isn't it that originally dan Aykroyd had this idea and th- this kernel of an idea developed uh, i don't know if you you read about what his original idea was apparently it was ghostbusters in in the future and there were loads of ghostbusters that's why they had the kind of the fire station idea so there were going to be loads of different um organizations that were fighting ghosts in the future uh, and the the director thought that it would cost maybe 300 million then <laughs> to make the film that that Dan Aykroyd wanted to make so they did a lot of changes and they they, they sort of scaled it down um but it, it to me it, it it's amazing that you think of who was originally teed up to do the film and then who ends up doing it so Bill Murray was never even meant to be in it was he no it was um it was written by obviously it was written by Dan Aykroyd with John Belushi in mind but it was also written with Eddie Murphy in mind but Eddie Murphy turned down Ghostbusters to do Beverly Hills Cop. And then obviously, because John Belushi died, people, I think people always think that Bill Murray replaced John Belushi, but Bill Murray technically replaced Eddie Murphy, I think. But then Harold Ramis came in because he was never originally meant to be one of the Ghostbusters. Yeah, uh, Harold Ramis decided that it, it would be best if he was Egon. He, yeah. He thought, I can do this. He decided his main... Um, selling point was he wasn't going to smile at any point during the movie, regardless yeah. of what yeah. was said. Yeah. And I think the if you read anything from Ernie Hudson, his interviews and the like, he seems to be suggesting that, or, or by implication, that perhaps um, the role when it was given to him was scaled right down from what it was yeah. always intended to be. So I think at yeah. some point Eddie Murphy was meant to be the the Zedmore character. And they scaled it all back. Although there's some confusion, depending on what you read. Some people say it was supposed mm. to be the Venkman character. Some people say yeah. he's meant to be the Zed Moore character. Uh, John Belushi was supposed to be Venkman um, at one point, yeah. and that would have been, you know, reprising the the Blues Brothers kind of relationship that he had with Dan Aykroyd. I think was it last week, last episode that I talked about Slimer, or was it even the the episode before that uh, that they they wanted Slimer to have a look of. Um, John Belushi to have almost it, literally his spirit in the film, yeah. and the scene where he's eating all of the uh, the food from the the plates that's supposed mm. to replicate, I think, Animal House. John Belushi in Animal House. Yeah. yeah. So all of the tie-ins to get to the point where everyone was in the same place in 1984 doing the film, I think it just worked so well. I saw I saw an interview with the actual special effects guy that designed the Slimer puppet. And, he's, and this is what he says. He says it was the night before the studio executives were coming down to choose which one they wanted in the movie. He had 12 different Slimers that he designed. I don't know why I held three fingers up when I'm saying 12. <laughs> 12. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets a phone call the night before saying, we want Slimer to look like John Belushi. So obviously he panics. He's like, the night before you're telling me this. So this is the way the story goes. The studio executives come down the next day they say, I can't believe what a good job you've done. And they choose the Slimer. And he says, I literally did nothing to it. I didn't change it. It just happened that one of them looked a bit like John Belushi. And that's the only joke. Yeah, so, you know, that. the myth or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the headline, which one do you go for? Is that right? I think the, the most unusual casting change is that they were talking to John Candy, weren't they, originally, to be Lewis? Lewis probably, yeah. And, and that was again. Well, he wanted to do it in a German of, accent. Well, he have, to do it and have two dogs, was it? Yeah. Think, as well. <laughs> you know, like we've got enough dogs in this movie already. <laughs> and and they ju- they just didn't think it would work. I think obviously they'd enjoyed working together because Ramus and Candy and Murray had worked together on stripes. So they probably thought that, that would work as a dynamic and it would probably would have worked. But I think Rick Moranis is I'm gonna go back to the usual Lloyd of talking about my minor characters, but <laughs> I think he steals every scene he's in, even though he's yeah, he's he looks, supposed he's really to be like an incidental character, isn't he? There's, yeah. there's a scene where oh. Dana's come back to her apartment and she's um, she's sneaking past Lewis's apartment, and he pops. She's tiptoeing, and he still hears her <laughs> and, and comes out. Yeah. But she's got a little smirk on her face, as if 
I was yeah. talking today about this, as if they'd redone the scene so much because she can't contain her laughter. And all yeah, the way yeah. through him coming out and asking, and she's like, oh, no, I've got a date tonight. And it's like, oh, you've got a date? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She's still, it looks like she's just fighting a laugh, fighting laughter. And then even when he's he's moving away and he's still talking to her, because he always talks to her, doesn't he, as she walks yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> and then she's moved, you know, oh, okay, you can bring him along too. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's as if like they've done the, she just keeps on breaking down to laughter every, every time. And it's just, I think it's just Moranis's performance. He's just, he's brilliant at it. He does exactly yeah. what he was supposed to do and he's I don't even think he's a minor character I think he's I, I'd say he's more prominent than Winston in the end who's actual Ghostbuster I, in terms of the characters yeah. um, in the film I think I think his character is is far more in the uh, in the main um, leading characters than, than certainly a supporting actor yeah it's it, him and Dana I suppose and and Winston they they all are kind of Somewhere between being a main a main character and a minor character, aren't they? So the focus really is on on the, the the first three because they're the first ones that we see, and it sets it all up. And then they bring on these others, and then they've got you know Annie Potts playing um, a br- brilliant role as well, haven't they? Um, as uh, Janine. Um, so there's lot, and and then and then William Atherton as well as uh, as Dave's favourite character. Yeah, pencil neck. I think he goes by a number of names during the movie. It, it's, the, it's the copper. It's like the the, um, the high ranking police officer he brings with him to the uh, firehouse that calls him pencil. You neck, do your it? job, pencil neck, and I'll do mine. <laughs> yeah. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I, I I wanted to talk specifically about Bill Murray. Lloyd's tried to get me to uh, watch a number of Wes Anderson films over the years, like the especially the the Life Aquatic with uh, uh, Steve Zizou and. That. Uh, it's not. I don't know what it is about his direction, and there'd be a lot of people, I'm sure, that object yeah, to, it, to my view. I, of I won't watch. I won't watch. I haven't watched any really of his other ones because I can't really watch them. But the Life Aquatic, I got into it, and it it won me over. Well, I I like Rushmore. That's probably the exception. That Jason Schwartzman oh, yeah. and, and yeah. Bill Murray is, is <laughs> yeah. in it. Um, but I've never really got into Life Aquatic. But I, I love Bill Murray in everything I've seen him in. So I should really embrace those sorts of films. Um, but the, the the role that he has is just all about subtlety and understatement, and then all of a sudden it's outrageous. So he says things all that are all, you know gentle, subtle comedy moments, and then there's something out, outrageous he says to to Dana, like you know, oh, and and then she made him leave or, or whatever he says, yeah. you know, like it was Started fun to, to speak to you, sir. You know, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't get to speak to you, sir. When you think about the the iconic part of the movie, what do you what do you think of? Do you think of a particular moment, or do you think it's a selection of moments? Is there something that you know? Imagery, of course, we've got the 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 ghost. You know, we've got this that that that's pretty strong imagery, and apparently that was something that was dreamt up by Dan Aykroyd almost at the start. That was one of the first things he actually thought he's almost built his whole film around that kind of idea. Yeah. Um, but is there something that you find that resonates with you as that's a, that's a seminal moment of the movie or. There's, there's, there's Janine. We got one that really sort of way. If you think it goes, do, do, it. do it properly. Press the button. You got you got one. <laughs> you do. Bit of Elmer Elmer Bernstein <laughs> kicks off. Yeah. Yeah, coming down the pole. Yeah, Ray. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Beckham coming down there with a pe- pencil in his mouth and a pad. And an Egon, yeah. uh, Egon coming down looking terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think that anyone could um could do that scene like Dan Aykroyd did. <laughs> the, the, yeah. What you've just done there, Lloyd, for, for anyone listening on the podcast, mm-hmm. like he gets off the pole and sort of leans back, puts his arms up and sort of like disorientated and then he goes to the door like... and then sort of does it again. <laughs> I like that scene, which I think epit- there's a scene that really epitomizes Peter Venkman's character. So they've just gone into That's the fine. Biltmore for their first proper job. Um, and they walk through the they walk through the you know the the, the doors, and the first thing Bill Murray, first thing that Venkman does is he sees a, a girl, a woman that's looking at him as she's walking past, and he just sort of like goes past, and he's sort of smiling. 
And then just as he finished looking at it, the the like the maitre D or the manager comes up from behind and he's oh! <laughs> so this reminds me of these yeah. ghost yeah. but just yeah. just the man coming to say hello. It's terrified. Yeah. It's like oh oh oh. But but before you know, before the scenes even ended, he's got the guy at the lift and the and the guy says, you know, who are you supposed to be? You know. And he says, uh, Co- uh, Cosmonaut, uh, you, you, Cosmonauts. <laughs> he said, uh, Exterminators. He said, Cockroach up on there. Yeah. Bite your head off, that man. That must be one hell of a cockroach <laughs> problem. <laughs> Bite your head off, man. Yeah. So that whole scene to me it epitomizes him. So he doesn't really know what he's doing. He's blagging the whole thing. But there's something about him. Yet he still finds time to flirt. Yet mm. he's kind of. Tried it still being funny. He, he, is, a, he is a blagger because if you think about one of the first scenes in the film, he proves his theory on negative reinforcement um, improving ESP potential for someone. So for shocking that poor fella, trying to guess what's on the cards, a couple of wavy yeah. lines. By doing the negative reinforcement and shocking him, the fella actually develops ESP because he gets the last one right. So Peter Apparently Venkman's that proved, was proved someone his theory. Did that. Apparently, a scientist did did do that, and yeah, so uh, he's, it's, he's, it's interesting you should mention that, Lloyd, because um, <laughs> we're going to have a little game right now. I'm not sure how well this will work on the podcast. Uh, for those who are listening, I have a number of cards with um, various symbols on, and I'm going to uh, ask you to guess these. You've got any chewing gum, Lloyd? Okay. So uh, no, uh, I'll give you some negative. I'll give you some negative reinforcement. I'm a little tired of this man. <laughs> So this Tell is what we're going to do, right? This is what we're going to do. Lloyd mm-hmm. is going to close his eyes because this is the only way we can do it to show whether he's right or not. So Lloyd closes his eyes. Are they closed, Lloyd? Right? You can see me. <laughs> okay. So the yes, choices are, this, is, this really. is important. This is important. The choices are wavy lines, circle, yeah, yeah, cross, square, square, or a plus, or a, plus, or a okay. star. This is making okay. really good podcast listening, by the way. So... so <laughs> Lloyd, we're going to win, we we're gonna win a BAFTA for this. What are we looking at? Sorry? Tell tell me what uh, I'm holding up. Circle. Oh, square, a star. Star, sorry. This is not your lucky day. <laughs> this is not your lucky day. <laughs> Dave, one for you. One for you. Close your eyes. Have a guess. Can't remember the choices. Um, a couple of wavy lines, one of the choices. Yeah, yes, a couple of wavy was. lines plus cross circle square. I, I want to go couple couple of wavy lines. Dave, you can now yeah. look. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna do we're gonna do one All one right, more each. Phenomenon. Okay, Lloyd, we're gonna do. A do you know what I went for so circle? Do you know what I went for circle? Because I closed my eyes and I saw a circle thing, and I thought this is actually working. And I realised <laughs> it was just basically because I've got a big circle light that my lighting, and it was just that on my retina which I was seeing. Right, okay, on. here's the second one. Are you ready? Close the eyes. Right. And now have a guess. Square. Close. Open your eyes. I opened it when the square was up. Yes. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> I did. I saw you. All right, Dave, last one for you. Last one for Why you. are you disproving this theory? Okay. Um, Whenever you're ready. Star. <laughs> <laughs> two for two. <laughs> Lord, you were rubbish. Yeah. Is this because you're trying to make a date with Dave for, for eight o'clock and you're just trying to like foil me, even though I was getting them right? Did I get the first one right, by the way? Did Adam? No. Did you change the circle to a star? No, you didn't. You actually, you're the only one who actually got one right, to be fair. <laughs> Doesn't matter. This whole bit's going to get cut anyway. <laughs> hey, well, thank you, podcast listeners. It, it was useful, useful for you. Yeah, we tried. Um, it didn't work. Never mind. What I liked about that scene, though, is. There's a couple of real subtle moments, aren't there? So there's a bit where he says, you only have uh, 75 more of these to go. <laughs> and then he says, paying we're paying you, aren't, you, aren't we? we? Yeah, we're paying you. And then right as he walks out, he said, you can keep your five bucks. <laughs> so he's getting electrocuted 80 times for five dollars. And I just think it's brilliant. And and even when he's just about to uh, electrocute him, he sort of goes, <laughs> the girl. Yeah, it doesn't he? So I was I was reading that Dan Aykroyd apparently was uh, surrounded by or um, his family members were classed as spiritualists. That his grandfather was a psychic investigator. Or, or you nodding, his Dave? Dad was, I think his dad was a, was a published author in in the realm of parapsychology. And I recall Stan Lloyd earlier 
his inspiration for Ghostbusters, besides being legitimately immersed in that kind of thing, was he said he was sat at home, he was surrounded by this loads of copies of this journal about supernatural stuff. And it just got him yeah. thinking that, you know, they'd probably, they'd probably make a good movie, that topic. Um, but, but yeah, that, that seems to have been the, 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 the inspiration for it. What do you guys think of um, look at, looking at other actors? What do you think of Sigourney Weaver's role? Um, well, I, I know that I saw a documentary that where they were talking about casting. They said they were, they were basically looking for someone that had good on-screen chemistry with Bill Murray. And obviously, Bill Murray's famously a little bit difficult to get along with anyway. And I think that comes across in, in the movie itself. He doesn't, but like Lloyd said, it's quite a strange, it's not even a relationship, you know, between him and Dana. And then basically when they found out Sigourney Weaver was interested, they were just desperate for it to be in the movie because she was a big name. I think she was always going to get it regardless of whether they had chemistry or not. Um, well, and obviously it she's worked well, though. Yeah, Don't definitely. Think? I think she she done a, she was the uh, she was the badass uh, hero from Alien, wasn't she? And so, you know, even though she's kind of the, almost the love interest, and she's the almost the victim of of Zool um, menacing her and then goes her, um, she still got that sort of strength to deal with that part of the role as well. Um, mm. And then obviously, there's a bit where Zool possesses her, where she's got to come across a certain way, which you know I think she's quite. She's quite a presence, isn't she? She's quite, she, you know, she's quite tall and stuff. I think it came yeah. across pretty well. Um, and that was some sort of uh, body cast, wasn't it? That moment that they apparently built a body cast for her. You know, when she um, raises off the bed and then twists around. Yeah, she was in like a full body cast. It was sort of less CGI and actually was more mechanical. Apparently. Oh yeah, you can see it because the whole way through, something's happening to what she's wearing as well. So she's trying to, she does that with her hands. And they make it as if it's part of like her ritual being possessed, but she's just putting down, she's pushing the dress back down over her hips because the mechanism's making the dress ride up. Yeah, you know we watched it's, it in four K. You start, you let me, you let me know it was on four K. In four K, oh, you can see the bit under, when she's going up. You can see the bit underneath the car. Well, I was watch, I was looking for wires. I was really scrutinising it. No, I couldn't see anything. No, it's it's basically so the rear of the shot. You've got something coming out towards it, and that's what's lifting it up. So right, the front like the of the shot, you don't see it because it's perp It's exactly hidden by. She's on a platform. You just see her legs going up. Pretty and down. much, yeah. But, no, but, but she rotates because it's as well. Yeah, because it rotates. So that because of the cast element of it, keeps you ah, in one place, right, rotates okay. around. We're it's talking wrong, about phys physical effects. You know the um, you know the opening scene in the basement of New York Central Library. Yeah, which is actually yeah. the basement of the LA Central Library. Apparently, the internal shot. You know, you know when all of the when she walk, as she walks past all the little cabinets with the tickets start opening yeah. and the tickets. Do you know that was an actual physical special effect? Yeah, I saw yeah, it because you can you, you can see the uh, behind them with a straw blowing into each one and just blowing with a straw was making them all fly out. There's one where there's, there's, there's pieces of paper actually crossing between the aisles. That that was on a wire. That was a physical effect. But everything in that shot is all completely physical. In camera effects, which is quite impressive, I think that's good. Yeah, it works so well, much better than CGI. The actual tickets that fly out of all those cabinets, you notice they're completely empty. There's nothing written or printed on them. They're just they're just blank pieces of paper. There, there was also uh, something I read the other day. I think it was uh, Ivan Reitman was driving in to to the set to do to film that scene, and he thought it'd be a really good idea to do the book stacking. Yeah, and that just came to him on the drive in. So I I love that. So no human being would stack books like this. <laughs> it is. It's like, like they were literally making it up as they went along. Uh, the 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 other ad lib that I quite like, if it's true, is when he said uh, <laughs> when Begman says to Spegler, "Oh, do you remember that time that uh, you tried to drill a hole in your head?" <laughs> and Ray was just turns around and he says, "That would have worked would if you hadn't stopped me." <laughs> Apparently, that was completely ad libbed as well. <laughs> so Lloyd. Finish the sentence. What about the? It's a hard question, <laughs> and you might need some more background. What about the? Egon has just explained how bad things could be down in the basement, and they say, "Tell them about the." And Bill Murray Twinkie. says, "Twinkie." Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Uh, Tell them about the Twinkie. What about the Twinkie? Dave, finish this. Uh, you're going to endanger our client, the nice lady who paid us in advance before. 
She uh, turned into a dog. Don't know. That'll do. That'll do. Yeah. Lloyd, an easy one, although you might not want to say the uh, answer. Yes, it's true. This man has no penis. <laughs> it's Dick. Um, but... Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by Dickless here. They caused an explosion. Is this true? Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> human sacrifice. I know, I know this. I know this. Two cats living, living together, but there's something yeah. in the middle. Human sacrifice. Uh, no. Dogs and right. cats living together. Mass, Mass hysteria. hysteria. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was thinking fire and brimstone, but that was, that was part of the proceeding. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Uh, Lloyd, uh, Ray, when someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. <laughs> and um, Dave, all right, this chick is toast. Awesome. Well done. You've passed with flying hey, colors, my the flat top. Um, <laughs> speaking <Yeah>. of... <laughs> That's awesome as well. Dan oh, do, do you know, flat, just, just, just quickly on that scene, this kind of sums up Benkman's character compared to his, his standing compared to the other two in the movie. The marshmallow on everybody, Venkman's pretty much clean, <laughs> apart from a little bit here and a little bit there. Yep. Everyone else is just like head to toe in it. When okay. I was a kid, and used to watch Ghostbusters, at the end, the bit that you just referenced, after they vanquished the, the marshmallow man, yeah. and he's exploded, yeah. and he's obviously covered... You know, most of Manhattan in in marshmallow, and yeah, they yeah. step out at the end victorious, and they're quite clearly covered covered in marshmallow. I thought Dana was wearing a wedding veil. <laughs> it, just it, just in relation to just before that scene, you know, when they're at the top of the the stairs and uh, they they go into Dana's room, and and Ray says. Uh, where do those stairs go? <laughs> yeah. says, they go up. They go up. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, he start, and, and again, it's another thing that epitomizes his character. He walks through to go up the stairs, and then there's you know there's sort of like a, a big loud noise or a crash. I think there's and like thunder goes, or lightning guys. or something, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And he goes, "Okay, guys, come on, after you." <laughs> so he's he at the back. So he's like yeah. leading through, and it was scary. They said, "Yeah, come on, we've got it. We've got to all patch through now, guys." When when you said before about the um, you know the iconic moments of that movie. I didn't. I didn't really give a give an answer to that. And as I mentioned uh, when I did Pop Quiz Hot Shot, although it wasn't technically the first movie I ever saw in the cinema, I always kind of count it as because I remember it so vividly. And um, watched most of it through my fingers. But for me, there's so many visual moments in there that are so iconic and stick in my mind, even from just the actual, uh, you know. Get her when the librarian turned, you know, ooh, she turns to the <laughs> That was your whole plan? Get her. Yeah. <laughs> Get her. Um, and <laughs> when they're, I mean, for, I think the most iconic bit for me is when the four of them are standing, you know, uh, with, with Gozer in front of them. She's yeah. facing them. He's, they're almost in silhouette and it's all, you know, really dramatically lit and everything. I think that that's just really iconic. But talking about um, Dana and the Terror Dogs. Did you know that it was Sigourney Weaver, Weaver that came up with the whole, um, you know, um, Hare and Lewis's character of basically turning to the dogs and going, go and stand on, really? the, on the altar? Yeah. She, I, and, I you know, because famously she did the whole, you know, where she turns into a dog. She did that, like, when she met Ivan Reitman. And she came up with the whole idea because – they had these plot holes, really, that they couldn't they couldn't connect. They didn't really know how they got onto the rooftop thing. They didn't know what the connection was from the from the characters of Lewis and Dana. So they had really? these concepts of 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 the gatekeeper and the lockmaster. Got that right way around. Key, key master, key master, <laughs> yeah. lockmaster. <laughs> so they, they had those concepts, but they didn't really know how that then related to, to the rooftop battle with Goza. And they always had the marshmallow man, but they didn't know what those elements were. So she was the one that came up with the idea of turning into the dogs. And then there's but that. It works. It works so well, Dave, doesn't it? Because they're on opposite corners of the the. Um, the building as well, so it, it works well in terms of the the symbolism of how the building is created, and yeah. 
it's the juxtaposition how those two would never ever get together in in real life as demonstrated by all their interactions yet they're there to find each other out when they're both possessed so i quite like that as a the fact that lewis kind of gets his girl but only when he's possessed that's what that's that's why i think the most genius part about sigourney weaver's casting is the, the physical difference between her and rick moranis I think that's that's the genius of and, putting those two together. Yeah, and when and when they when they hook up as a key master <laughs> and a gatekeeper, um, they do that classic lean over kiss. But she's on top, isn't she? She's leaning him over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like that. What's it called? Yeah. A dip, isn't it? It's a dip kit. So dipping it and kissing him. It's like it's brilliant. Bless him. Oh, I, I just I, had, it just popped in my head. Lewis as well. <laughs> He's already tiny. But like in, in the foot, when he's wearing his tracksuit, his tracksuit leg, yeah, that was like exactly about before. six inches too short. Yeah, that's just a genius touch. It just makes it him so great, funny. It? Yeah, but, in the wind. It's, 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 every, it's, everything. <laughs> it's everything with him, isn't it? Even when he, he's just describing how he he taped a twenty minute workout and watched it in double quick speed, so he did a ten minute workout. Yeah, he got twice, great work, twice. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, I have I have a little surprise for you. Hopefully, hopefully this will work. I don't know if okay. it will. Um, so um, for the for the listeners and viewers, I'm going to send Dave somewhere, and he doesn't even know where he's going. Genuinely, do you don't know what I'm talking about? Do you, Dave? No. Okay, so I want you to go outside to your front door, go round to the bins in front of your house, and look behind the green bin and get what's behind the green bin, please. This sounds go. like scream. Is is family's tied up and gagged? <laughs> Dave, you've, you've got to go because we're, we can't edit this very well. Dave, Dave. Yeah? Can you hear me when you leave the room? No. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for all of those people who are still here and paying attention and listening, Lloyd and I have been collecting various um, pop movies type Funko models Funko, as we've Funko gone along. Pops. So Funko, Funko Pops. And... Um, we both chose our respective um, favourites for Ghostbusters, Venkman for Lloyd and for me, Egon, which we'll put away right now. And we know how much that Dave really, 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 really likes Ghostbusters. So uh, we thought it would be a nice treat uh, to get him a present. So Dave, have you managed to find your present? So you have no idea what's in there, do you? Is this an unboxing video now? Yeah, it's an unboxing video. Let's so, get um, views somehow. Unboxing yeah. videos seem to work. Okay. Uh, other supermarkets are available. <laughs> so, Dave, this is our little um, little idea, a little present for you for being such a good friend. Ah, right. Please now uh, narrate yourself opening a box. <laughs> Sorry. Do it on camera. Expensive paper, <laughs> and I used to open open presents and try to like not rip it, so she could like reuse it. Fine, Adam, your Fine. cool, your cool little like surprise segments for this show, like none of them work on a podcast. Yeah, I noticed that. Ironically, I think the podcast where it works. Check it out. You see that? Mm -hmm. Doctor Ray Stamp Funko Pop Seven Four Five. Thank you. That's awesome. How come? What have I done to deserve like presents? Because it, it's meant to go Dave, with these, Dave. We've been secretly yeah. for every sh every show. Adam and I have been buying Funko Pops for that movie and <laughs> seeing if you'd notice. For example, you, you bought, you bought yeah. me that one, so you bought me right. Hans Gruber. Yeah, um, Hans Gruber. I I got Tony, Tony Vesky. Right. Yeah, yeah. R Roy Batty, right. Blade Runner. <laughs> I, I got Rick Rick Deckard. <laughs> <laughs> you two have got more sense than money. Yeah, no, the other way around. Um, I, like it. I got five. Of it. This is my this is my favorite one. I've got to get him out of the box. Brody. He's yeah, my Brody one's my absolute favorite because you take them out of the box. Yeah, because he's got he's got um oh, he's like got cigarettes yeah. and yeah. a little bucket of chum. <laughs> yeah. So check I like it. Check out that gargantuan Funko Pop. Doesn't it instantly devalue now? I think it devalues. If we if we hold them on on a video, <laughs> there it is. Oh, with the trap, awesome. So there you go. Um, do, happy do, did you know day. that they um, the um, the props dude had to? They made the trap smaller in Ghostbusters Two 
Because in Ghostbusters 1, the cast were complaining about how heavy everything was. Yeah, and the proton packs as well. That's oh, why yeah, they changed that. the proton packs, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, Bill Murray. Bill Murray wouldn't do it, apparently, unless... Well, he didn't want to do it anyway, did he? Didn't he come into doing Ghostbusters 2 somewhere? The... He okay. just didn't how like did the they, idea. How did, they the to do Ghost, how did they call him into doing Ghostbusters 2016 then? Um, he's, be, he's pretty much felt like he's been conned each time he's gone back and done another one. He's felt like he, he didn't really artistically want to do another Ghostbusters movie. He's, he's not really like an afterlife, film. is he? Huh? He's an afterlife, I think. Is it? Oh, there he is. Hate it when they do that. Most of mm. them are in it. I, I, oh. I understand he's in the he's in the 2016 remake, but I've never lasted more than seven minutes into that movie. So you never might last more than seven minutes for a lot of things, Dave. <laughs> seven minutes is pretty good going. It is actually these <laughs> days. Yeah. That's uh, all. So, so um, do, do you either of you guys know what the original title was for the movie? Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. Um, no. Look, you know, I do. Uh, so, so when Dan Aykroyd wrote the script, he had the um, the working title of Ghost Smashes, I believe. There was a few other ones that I've heard bandied around. Uh, but by the time it went into production, they obviously wanted it to, to call it Ghostbusters, but they had the issues that you mentioned during the introduction with getting, getting rights to that name. So during a lot of scenes, they actually had to film them twice using the word Ghostbusters and the... Uh, Ghost Breakers as well, even down to the scene where they're putting up the handwritten sign on the firehouse. They had to do it Ghostbusters and then take it down and then film it again with another yeah. one that said Ghost Breakers. Um, I understand the when they were, when they were filming the scenes outside. Um, what's the name of of the building that that, that that Lewis and Dana live in? Let's call it Zool for argument's sake. <laughs> the Zool school. building. Yeah. So what? When, when they're filming the scenes, you know, just before the pavement starts cracking and all that, uh, and the Ghostbusters actually roll up and the crowd's all going, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters. Apparently the guy, one of the guys on the production, basically phoned the studio from a nearby payphone, and he basically held it, you know, listen to, you know, like uh, Back to the Future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, oh, this is your you cousin. Know, the, the new sound you're <laughs> looking for. Listen to this. Yeah, he goes, listen to this. And he says, we are not calling this movie Ghost Breakers. It's just, you know, Ghostbusters sounds amazing when they're chatting there. So the story goes, uh, Frank Price, who, who you mentioned earlier, was ahead of Columbia that greenlit the movie originally. But they knew they had this issue, these issues over, over getting rights to using the name Ghostbusters. As, as luck would have it, um, call it fate, call it luck. <laughs> Oh, it can't, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> um, I believe everything that happens for a reason. <laughs> so um, during production of Ghostbusters, um, Columbia Pictures was bought by Coca-Cola, and this guy, Frank Price, didn't didn't see eye to eye with them. So we actually ended up moving to Universal, who, as luck would have it, was, the, was the, the studio that owned the rights to the name Ghostbusters. So he eventually signed the deal, which gave the rights of the name to Columbia, which is, you know, full circle where we started off. So. Pretty nice little story. When did they commission um, Ray Parker Jr. to to sort of craft the the theme song? That well, not the theme song, but the you know yeah, the, this uh, was the main pretty, Ghostbusters song. Pretty late in the day as well. Obviously, right. if you think about it, for the same reason. I mean, he would have had to have done two versions, but um, yeah, the, I, I understand. You know, you kind of the one condition that that, that they gave him was it. The, the song had to contain the word Ghostbusters, and he just said there was no yeah. good yeah. way to get that into a song, and he was struggling to find an angle on it. And it's, do you know what? Do you know why they said that? Do you know why they had to get Ghostbusters into it? Right, because the song was one of the one of the biggest elements of marketing for the movie. Mm. So that yeah, song was yeah. released before the movie even came out, and anyone knew anything about the film. This what because it had. If you if the the music video had scenes from the film in it, obviously cut together, but just having the word Ghostbusters bouncing out the radio, it was just all pre marketing for the, for the film that was going to be still like probably a couple of months away. But I heard um, in relation to the, the the video for it that you know how uh, I think I think Chevy, Chevy Chase had turned down the one of the roles, but um, for for you know one of the main characters in in the film, but he appeared in the the music video for. Um, Ghostbusters, as did have, a, a have you, number of other people. Yeah, have you watched? Have you watched the music video recently? 
No, not it's recently. Okay. Like, watch, yeah, basically, I don't think anyone was played the song. No one had seen the movie and knew what it was about. So it's basically, right, when we go action, just say Ghostbusters to that sort of tempo, that pattern. So <laughs> somebody just go Ghostbusters, Ghost. Busters, that's all, it's just none of it fits with the song. It's, they've basically just well, done they, it all. Isn't it a bit where they're walking down the street like that, which is what they famously reused oh, in the real Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah, um, the actual cast, cast, yeah. yeah. Like a ticket tape parade, but them doing that yeah. now. Yeah. But the celebrity so the song, bits at the end are pretty awful. He, he, he had only basically done a demo of the song, and, and they had a, he had a motorbike courier take it to Ivan Reitman. And Ivan Reitman phoned um, Ray Parker Jr. and think and said I love it and he said alright okay but that, I've got to do the proper I've got to record a proper version and he, it was like too late it's in the movie already that's how close it was to the end of production they needed to get this movie out and they um, needed that and song it, on it wasn't it so tight that actually the people who were shouting Ghostbusters on the track are like his are like Ray Parker Jr's family because he couldn't <laughs> get proper singers it was some, I what I've read is it's something like it was so last minute it was like uh, you'll do <laughs> come in here and just shout Ghostbusters <laughs> Do you know when I first heard it as well? I can remember this quite clearly. So you had you had the Wide Awake Club, I think, on a Saturday morning. Yeah. And it had Tommy Boyd, Tommy Boyd, I think he was called. Michaela Strachan. Yeah. He was. Michaela Strachan, yeah. And they basically went, right, we've got this new song. So they put it on Neil the kitchen Buchanan. to market it. Neil Buchanan. Yes. Yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, no, I don't know. I don't know initially yeah. if he was. Right, right at the start of the Wide Awake Club. This is like yeah. in the early days of it. So Tommy Boyd's like, right, I've got a new song. It's for a new movie. And every time they say who you're going to call, you've got to shout Ghostbusters at the top of your voice. And it was just, so that was like Saturday morning television. It's all these kids. So it's all these kids are shouting Ghostbusters. Going to school Monday morning, they're going, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. And the movie's not even out yet. So as soon as the movie's released, everyone's like, you know, take us to see 1984. Take us to see Ghostbusters. I want to go to see Ghostbusters. It's just genius. And that was, and that was, that was the, yeah, as you say, genius. The genius move was they, they, Basically, filmed a uh, a movie that was really aimed for late teens up, wasn't it? It was you know some adult themes, lots of people yeah. smoking all the time during the movie, um, yeah. and you know some some quite I suppose quite adult subjects and 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 the relationship mm. issues and you know sexual Let, issues and let's let's not forget love... the let's not forget the the the, the Ray. The Ray scene with the with the zip. yeah that I I'd not seen for years. <laughs> I must have seen it initially, and then when it's been on terrestrial television, yeah, and then you think you've dreamt it because ITV cut yeah. it out like, throughout the whole of the eighties. I'm sure, it's seen the, the, that. the the scene you know when they're in the prison cell or the the jail. Yeah, I love and, that as well. All the and, prisoners and, taking a load of interest and just moving in, looking at them. And uh, and um, so be good for goodness and, sake. sake. And, oh, and Dave, somebody's coming. Dave, Somebody's Dave's, coming. Dave's favorite actor of all time, Reginald Vel Jolson. Yeah, Al Jolson. <laughs> Al Jolson. Um, who who said that he actually auditioned for for Winston as well, and then got the prison guard job. So that you know, good luck. Well, and yeah, when they when they're all gathered around them, and they've got the you know, I don't know how when you get arrested, you can have like six foot maps that you can roll up yeah. and like no, take the, with you. In the clothes, isn't it? Because Ray gets out the yeah. blueprints, doesn't he, for the building from his like pants or something? And they're 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 explaining it all, and um, apparently, I'm not sure if this is true, but apparently that particular place was was like a, a a cell area and it was famous for being haunted and there were actual scratches down oh, yeah. I, I, to I, the I, wall. I, 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 yeah. And and Reitman hated film though. He said we've got to get in there, do it and get out. So I quite liked the right. idea that there was some subtle kind of whether that was part of creating the buzz about the film, I don't know, but it's interesting to hear that you know there might have been some paranormal concern even if whether or not it's oh, true or not cool. it's irrelevant. Yeah. The other thing I quite like is um and we probably have to record this at some point, uh, us saying, we're here to believe you. Um, we're ready to believe you. We're ready to sorry. believe you. Dave's, already, Dave's <laughs> already corrected me about that tonight. <laughs> we're ready to believe you. Um, the brilliant thing about that is Ivan Reitman decided it was a good idea, didn't he, to uh, release that as an actual advert. Yeah, um, with the phone number. It, with the phone number, and yeah, if you rang the number, it it yeah. said something like, uh, "We're out catching ghosts." Well, ghosts and ghosts got... at the moment. 
Yeah, and and they got something like a thousand calls a day for weeks and weeks, and it really did genuinely. Yeah. We should do now five five five, the great movie show. Let's just put it up on the screen now. We're ready, ready to, to believe. To believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we're not actors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so do you so, you guys you guys know that um the movie was re- released on the 8th of June 1984 in the US? Do you know what other film was released on the same day? Well, yeah, I do. I do. 1984. I do. Um Would you like to clue? Would you like Jaws a clue? Two? I don't need a clue. Uh, no, no. no, I'll give you a clue because uh, no, Dave I'll already give you the clue, knows. The thing is, like, as, as the new viewers know, I don't like meticulously research everything before I go on. Everything you get is madcap theories from my head when we're talking and about And that's these a good movies. thing. Okay, so this, this, this other film stars in a very small way, but definitely at the beginning, a young Corey Feldman. Gremlins. Yes. Gremlins. Yes. And bonus bonus question, which Lloyd will probably already know the answer to, the fact I've said bonus question. Is there anything familiar about um, the uh, set on which they film Gremlins? Yes, it's a very famous set. You might remember it from Back to the Future. Also, early days, maybe it, it came from outer space or something was set there. Yep. And in most recent times, One Division had a couple of scenes in, uh, in that set as well. All ticks. Dave, do you know what Egon collects as a hobby? Mm. I do. He can, I know. And, and there's a grammatical error in there as well. So he collects spores, moulds, and fungus, but he should uh, really collect spores, moulds, and funguses. Because no. Fungi. The f- fungi for plural of fungus. All right. Okay. So, okay. I admit that. I was wrong. But if you're going to be smart. Be, unless he's collecting a single fungus. Then it should be spores, molds, and fungi. Should be the answer. I guess it doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. Dave, do you know the um, the fire station that was used? And that might be a trick question, mightn't it? Yeah. So um, obviously the, ex- the external shots for Ghostbusters were mostly filmed in New York, and. Uh, the start of production, they didn't actually have any of the permits in place. So a lot of the shots we see, like in the musical montages, where the three Ghostbusters are just like running down the street in New York and people are looking at them, they did that without permission. They just did it like Gonzo style on the fly. <laughs> um, but obviously the the external shots, the famous firehouse is Hook and Ladder 8 um, in Tri- Tribeca, I think it is. It's just around the corner yeah. from from uh, well, the World Trade Center, as was. Yeah. But obviously, the uh, the internal shots were done in a completely different firehouse in Los Angeles. I um, can't remember what it's called, which has also been used for other movies as well. It was it's it's been it's been demolished now. I think it was used in um, Big Trouble in Little China was one of them. I watched that again the other night actually, and uh, I think that's aged quite well. You wouldn't think oh, a film got, like we've got, big, big, we've got to do Big Trouble in Little China at some point on the show. We do. There's so many. We've got to do a John Carpenter, that, haven't we? Yeah. Stay puffed marshmallows. Mm. Where do you see them throughout the movie before see the it. final scenes? So there's a there's a do you want to answer it, Adam? Yeah, I one of them is there's a billboard. There's yeah, a billboard. You see the billboard. I think you see the billboard. The spirit, yeah, you see it twice. There's a wide shot. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, like but a also, to Matt Payton. But but also next to the eggs when the eggs are exploding. She yeah, I was them. thinking yeah. why she she lives on her own, right? She's got a massive bag of marshmallows. She's bought eggs and what sort of crazy woman is she? She's bought eggs and marshmallows and in celery. like a daily shot. And celery. And celery. Well, then have... the, the veggies change in various shots, apparently. So I've got a question for you two. Go on. Okay. Um, obviously, Ghostbusters 2016 wasn't particularly successful. Before you move on, on that, the ro- yes. I've, like, I've watched it. I've forced myself to. I, I, I couldn't watch it the first time. I got it. Someone gave it to me. I know I got a code to get it for free. So I had it for yeah. free. Yeah. I watched it. Like you said, I couldn't get through the first sort of 15 minutes. I turned it off. Yeah. I forced yeah. myself to watch it. The writing is very yeah. good. Yeah, the writing of yeah. it is, br- is so I was watching it going. And the actresses, 
who play the Ghostbusters are very good actresses. It's just yep. there's a disconnect between the comedy of the writing and the delivery, which I don't get why it doesn't work, but it doesn't. The, the, some of these lines are just when I, when I go through them in my head, like ten seconds after seeing it on the on the screen, I, I thought it was awful and it dropped dead on the screen. But I'm laughing in my head when I'm just going yeah. through the line because the writing's so funny. So it's just yeah, it's such a shame that that film that film just didn't work. Um, okay. Sorry, go on, Dave. Thanks for answering the question that I didn't ask. So uh, I, 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 I'd echo what Lloyd is saying in relation to um, the remake of Ghostbusters. I think there's a, a thought process that anyone who says they don't like the 2016 version is some sort of misogynist or you know they hate the idea of women um, taking over the role of men or anything. I don't think it's anything to do with that at all. I think exactly what Lloyd said. There are so many things that could work in that movie and separately i think they all do i think the writing's really good i think the acting's really good the casting's really good Kristen wiggs brilliant in most of the things she's in yeah. mckinnon really good at saturday night live melissa mccarthy makes a lot of movies that probably should be really bad movies good movies uh, what's the, uh, the reason why i just i just couldn't watch i couldn't watch ghostbusters 2016 i just cannot do it i just find it cringeworthy i just can't I, do I don't, it i don't think it's cringeworthy i just i don't know it's just it's terrible the, the writing's brilliant Ridiculous. it just doesn't the delivery is just not quite fitting with the writing it just doesn't work what's the name of um egon's um equivalent in that is it Holtzman, McKinnon? Gillian Holtzman. that's mckinnon isn't it yeah the actress name kate mckinnon yeah, and Saturday Night Live, she's brilliant. And she was good in Ghostbusters 2016. It just and nothing, had, it just didn't meet up. It just didn't it just didn't exactly. connect. And they, they had what was it, Paul Feig, who did Bridesmaids, and Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy were in that. And that worked really, really well. But it was somehow like transferring it over to that to, mm -hmm. to the remake mentality. Yeah. It, it it just yeah. There, and there were a couple of good moments in there, were a couple of like real laugh out loud moments, but generally as a film, I I just unfortunately think it's inferior. And then you have the the debate over whether it should be part of the Ghostbusters canon. I think even um, Jason Reitman effectively said he's ignored that and he's treating Afterlife as like the third movie in the in the trilogy. Just remind me, Paul Feig directed a few episodes of The Office, the US yeah. Office, which Harold Ramis directed a few as well. Did he? I didn't know that. Yeah. No. I don't know how many, but he definitely, yeah, one or two uh, episodes of The Office Harold Ramis directed. Uh, go, going back to what you said right at the start, I think um, you, you're right. Caddyshack was f the first film directed by Harold Ramis. He's brilliant. He's, he's, yeah, so growing up, like, I think Venkman like, is probably still Evan's favourite character as well. He's certainly my favourite character growing up because he's dominating on screen and everything. And the story, he seems to drive the story forward. But watching it back these days, Egon, definitely my favourite character. He's just, he's he's subtle, he's understated through the film, but he's always... He's got these little quips and these little subtleties which are funny all the way through. He loses his rag in the mayor's office and attacks Walter Peck when he gets so yeah. angry, which is great because it's like it's a departure from his normal character. Then on the roof of the Shandor building, is that right, Dave? Shandor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sh yeah Shandor building with the, with the gate to mm. uh, goes of the Gonzarian. Is that right? I don't know. Gonzarian. <laughs> Gonzarian. Go Gonzarian. Goes of the Gozarian. Yeah, that's right. Gonzo, yeah. the Gonzo, Gonzo the Gonzarian. <laughs> <laughs> He's at the gate for Gonzo the Great. Uh, do one of his tricks. Um, and then the, the, I think that it's when the first, you know, when she goes, and then die, yeah. which is rubbish. Yeah. Put your hand, And yeah. then put it out to the side. For the die. emperor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like going out, to, it's yeah. just, yeah, it was really sort of theatrical almost like mm. over choreographed and they all go to the edge of the building Win Winston gets thrown up on the table on the, the mm. stone sort of altar the others almost go off the edge which and then they're trying to come up with a plan and um Venkman asks Ray for something and I don't I think Ray just doesn't say anything and he goes like oh yeah. Ray's a bye bye and he goes uh, <laughs> he, he goes like Egon <laughs> and Egon says something he goes I'm terrified past the capacity for rational thought or something like yeah. that. Beyond the capacity that was, for rational thought. It's looking at the marshmallow man, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> I'm terrified beyond the capacity for rational thought. I just, yeah. Yeah. I've never heard that growing up as a kid or I never would have yeah. paid attention to it. But like watching it these days, it's like that just line, I just find it, it's just brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I'm terrified yeah. beyond the capacity for rational thought looking at this big marshmallow. 
don't under, underestimate the impact of, of Egon as a character for, for, you know, kids growing up in the 80s that didn't, that maybe like me were a bit geeky and didn't feel like they really fitted in. Not your archetypal hero. You've then got somebody on screen that you can kind of, you can kind of identify with, you know. Obviously, everyone loved Venkman, but, you know, secretly, like, like you said, like you say now, you can see it. I could see it back then, you know. Yeah. And he wasn't the cool one, but there was. He still had something about him, didn't he? Still had a, yeah. a cool edge to him. It's it's yeah, funny it that the, the the three characters. That I would say that if you had to give a, I don't know, one word description for each of the characters, I'd say you've got Venkman as a chancer. You've got uh, Ray, uh Spengler. You've got as the geek or the nerd. Yeah. Academic. And then I and then I'd say that. Uh, Dan Aykroyd as Ray Sants is probably just goofy, so yeah. you'd sort of say Chancer, goofy, and nerd. Yeah, and he's a cross, and they though, isn't really... he? Because he he is academic as well, but he's yep. a bit he's a he's a he has his vacant moments. He's a bit like me, I suppose. Well, yeah. <laughs> this brings me into my first my first um, error, I think, when they were shooting it, and I've always thought this ever since I've been able to comprehend what was what was being discussed in the scene. So it's you know, don't look directly at the trap, Ray says. Mm. The first time they're catching the ghost. Yeah. Ray's the academic and the scientist. Egon's the academic and the scientist. And then Egon says, I looked at the trap, Ray. Yeah. When Egon, would, Egon would know the effect it would have on him. He would know all that already. He's basically designed it with Ray. So I always mm. felt that was Venkman's line. But someone's mistitled um, it in the script. Yeah. Like Egon says, I looked at the trap, Ray. I'd love to ask. Like, obviously, I can't ask Ivan Reitman or Howard Ramis now. But yeah. I'd love to ask him. It's like... Did you not? Th wasn't that someone else's line that's been misprinted? I, it, it I quite like the idea him. that it's meant to be him, though. Yeah, it shows fallibility. It shows he, yeah. he's not. You know, he's not completely, completely perfect. No, he's he's, out of his he looked, zone, no, he, no he? I don't. I don't mean the fact he looked at it. That he, you know, if he knew the danger, he wouldn't look at it. He's looked at it, but he's mm. he's telling Ray is in. I looked at it, Ray. What does it mean? What does it? You know. What, I think the reality is that they didn't know. They didn't actually know until that moment what was going to happen because they'd never used it the, the equipment but, before. But also, don't you think that that it kind of follows You're on from debunking me on this point? I'm not being debunked and having a clown horn but, put over but, me. <laughs> but the thing, the thing I really liked about that, actually, I think that you you're right in a way, Lloyd, that it probably should have been Venkman. But the fact that it's Egon probably works for me a bit better because it shows that. The, you know, it's like when he's got the the thing out and he says, "What do you think?" and he starts having a little go, and he's like, "Get rid of that! I'm not yeah. talking about you calculating. Yeah. You know, just come <laughs> he up because he to chops because, the calculator. <laughs> because he can't think on his feet at all, and he can plan stuff. And he, you know, he designed the proton pro, proton packs. Yeah. Right for the information, bit, the interest alone in the first twelve months is ninety thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah, but there, there you go. Another throwaway is ninety thousand dollars. Uh, Thanks, the Dave. throwaway line from you Venkman is... You're never going to regret this, Ray. Don't, don't worry. Everyone has three mortgages these days. But <laughs> when when they're in the list... How are we, we going to afford this? I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. The, the bit in the lift is absolutely brilliant because you've got... Um, they're all looking up at the, you know, obviously the lift numbers are going up in front of them. We can't see that because we're looking at their faces. But they're yeah. looking up and you see Ray yeah. sort of looking up like this. And... They're not looking. They're not talking. They're talking to each other, but it's like fixed like this. And he says, "I think we're going to have to do this." And that you can see their faces behind. And he says, "You know, can you turn me turn it turn it on?" Yeah. And uh, Egon says, to like, yeah. and, but, and but he says, he says, uh, he says, uh, I blame myself." And Venkman goes, "Yeah, I do too." And then when he turned <laughs> it, and, and the thing is, because Egon's designed it, when he turns it on, he shouldn't be surprised by the sound or anything. But as you've just said, Dave, he sort of goes, "Yeah." Backs into the corner, moves completely yeah. to the side yeah. but, then it, but then it cuts so yeah. they don't make a big thing out of the scene it's almost yeah. like a throwaway thing and there's a few things in Ghostbusters where it is just throw away well, but it's so important it, the... you know it's just occurred to me we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment I blame myself so do I, I no sense worrying about it now why worry each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back right okay so Obviously, Ghostbusters 2016 has been and gone. There's Ghostbusters Afterlife coming out. Um, but my question is, do you think if, if it was a possibility that they should go back and, and attempt to basically do a special edition of Ghostbusters, redo all the special effects, you know, try and stick the original movies, stick with the spirit of the movie, 
clean it up, redo some of the special effects. Do you think that would be a good thing or a bad thing? Do you think that would take some of the kind of spirit away from it? So, I mean, I'll call out a couple of things in particular. Obviously, um, the, the terror dogs, when they when they break through Lewis's door and they hit the corridor, it's kind of really obviously awful stop motion animation, isn't it? Yeah, it's Harry. It's Harry Housen, isn't it? It's your yeah. um, Sim, yeah. Jason the Argonauts uh, style. Jason the Argonauts, yeah. you, yeah. you Sinbad in the Seven Seas, wherever it was, you got yeah. you got that, and it's great. It, it works. So when, when you did put it. it, sorry. Do you think we'd hate it if they went and redid it and it was no, amazing because you know what? rendered what? CGI? When I was watching a 4K version, the um, the close-ups on the Devil Dogs yeah. were brilliant clarity. It's as if, I don't know if the original footage was like that or as if they've gone back to some sort of modelling and, and taken like a 4K shot almost. I don't know if you noticed that bit when it's just like... Well, they made, just they made the real Dogs. physical animatronic models of them which they could film, but obviously but when they the, were moving, the shot's perfect, but yeah, obviously with the moving yeah. around, they've got they've got yeah, the stop yeah. motion. I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it would take anything away. I think it'd improve it because I think, you know, we talked about um, in the Jaws episode, we talked about Bruce. Bruce is the worst thing yeah. about Jaws. Mm. And yeah. I think the worst thing about Ghostbusters is when they're overreaching for the special effects. Mm. And I think if they, you know, that's something where they could... Make it better. Although, I'll tell you what looks good, even now, when the ghosts ex uh, escape from the firehouse, when Peck shut down the containment. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. really good. When they're all coming out, please. Yeah. Yeah. Do, 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 please. And when they're, when, just, they're, when they're all flying towards Dana's apartment, yeah. that still all stands up. Uh, really and, good. and even even the Marshmallow Man was done was done combination of kind of... Uh, miniatures for the for the city shots and they even had a guy in a suit actually for for some like you know the shot from the side where his hot his yeah. head's bobbing in between yeah. the building tops yeah, yeah. that's a guy in a suit and also where he's starting to climb the building that's a guy in a suit because <laughs> there's a story if you watch it closely as that shot when he's starting to climb you notice that his red his red necktie is missing in that shot right. apparently the guy was in a hurry to get onto the set to do that shot and he forgot to put <laughs> the tie back on so if you watch it yeah, back one job, just put the <laughs> yeah, tile. Exactly. Yeah. But I think all that stuff stands up. It's only the stop motion oh. thing that really stands out to what's, me. What, what's the line that Venkman says when he's climbing the building? It's like, um, tell me when it, we get to floor twenty-four because no, I've got to throw up. I want to throw up. No, I mean when the when the marshmallow man starts climbing the building, it's something like, "Oh, he's a sailor. We're in New York. We just need to get him laid. We'll all be sorted." Yeah, <laughs> yeah and apparently that's yet another ad lib. Apparently as yeah. well. That was all all him. Uh, did you know that they uh, dropped fifty mm. pounds of shaving cream over the top of William Atherton for the the scene where Pet gets covered in in yeah. marshmallow? And, <laughs> and he's like, ah! the, and, and the, the supposed to be a bit, and I, it's something like on the DVD commentary. There's supposed to be a bit that you're supposed to be able to hear where he says, "I hate Venkman," even when he's getting All covered. Right. Um, I I I think he's a really good character and it's quite nice that they put him in there at the end because there's no need for him to be in there. It was just an extra little no. laugh, really, wasn't it? He's just he's walking along and he gets covered in all of the uh, the marshmallow. So Dave, I'm sure you've got a couple of other questions, but one of the things I was wanting to talk about briefly is um the serendipity of some of the character choices. Mm. So for example, Peter Venkman uh, was Supposed to be played at one point by Michael Keaton, right? That would um, work. And That'd exactly. Work. And I, when was Batman? Eighty nine or earlier? Eighty eight. Eighty eight. Eighty eight. Eighty nine. So he wasn't going to do that. Um, but the other one that I quite like the idea of, and you can kind of see how it might have worked at the time. It'd been slightly different tone, but you can you can see how it would have worked. Stephen Guttenberg. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but interestingly, he turned down the role to star in the first Police Academy, mm. which obviously had major success and became he became yeah. the household name he did because of that. And then Eddie Murphy already was was doing all right after Forty Eight Hours and, and Trading Places, but he turned it down to do Beverly Hills Cop, and actually that was the only film that outgrossed Ghostbusters that year. So, right. it, it's in that's interesting to me that. Each of the people that could have been in it actually did really, really well not doing it, but the film didn't lose out from not having those people. And uh, a number of people who I think, again, you can see them in this role and it would change it slightly, but still be really good performances. Obviously, we all, Dan Aykroyd was always going to be Ray Stantz, but Egon Harold Ramis, um, I've got a list here. Um, Chris Walken, Christopher Walken, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that would have been these things, and they're just talking about what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's ghosts. They're just like ghosts. Um, your, you just did your Jeff Goldblum for like push and walking. It was another one. Running. It's, yeah. another, it's another one that's that's hilarious that you say that. And so yeah. that was my Jeff Goldblum. Um, yeah. He he would have really heard like sparkles. Or his sparkles. <laughs> yeah. Um, Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think too old. I th I don't think it would have worked, but. He, he was another one, but and and John Lithgow as well. But you could see the 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 casting idea behind it all. Yeah, yeah, I kind of get that. But certainly, I think I think Jeff Goldblum would have been a really interesting. Yeah, evil. he would. He would. Yeah. But what? What? First, I mean, first general question: What do you think about the soundtrack and putting the actual Ghostbusters theme to one side? What do you think about the combination of kind of El like the Elmer Bernstein, Bernstein yeah. theme do, do, and do, do, there's, do, there's do, a few do, 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 pop do, songs do. in there as well? Well, I mean, I think I think the soundtrack's mainly. Sorry, I'm answering my own question. I think the soundtrack's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the Elmer Bernstein stuff is really good. It kind of really adds it atmosphere is. and, and, and bump, 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 bump. I like I like I like most of the pop songs in it. I especially like uh, Saving the Day, obviously in in like the, the final yeah, scene. That's cool. Um, but I'm not keen on that Thompson Twins song when when the spirits are all surging yeah. towards. Have you seen yeah, yeah, the, 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 the song, song in its entirety is a lot different as well. They've yeah. basically cut the thing that fits the film. Bus Boys cleaned up the town. It's very good. That's used twice mm -hmm. in the movie, isn't it? That's really good. Disco Inferno was on the soundtrack because it's yeah. played at Lewis's, Lewis's party. party. Yeah. Because yeah. right. I always wondered why that was on the soundtrack. I was like, why have we got Disco Inferno? Like Tramps? Is so, it though? Is it, do you actually hear it at the party? I, yeah, I you, do. you do. You do. Is it do. when she says, is, is it when she says, Lewis, I'm going home? He says, and he gets to dance with her. Well, if we start dancing, then maybe everyone else will dance. And then he goes in, <laughs> he goes in for a slow dancing. dance. He goes into hug her and she just goes, that's <laughs> <laughs> that. And they, they dance for literally like two seconds. He goes, I'm going to have to get that. And she goes, yeah. Is it Tom and Annette that turn up? Is it Tom and Annette? <laughs> That's so uh, funny, that scene. Yeah. Um, but, so, you know, you, t you, t you talk about the soundtrack, though. You know, at the very start, when it focuses on the New York Library and then it pans across to, it's a lion, isn't it? I think the statue yeah, of the yeah. lion in front of it. Yeah. But the music's quite sinister and sharp. It is, and yeah. Quite yeah. Cutting. It the, and, yeah. But we don't know the significance of statues in the movie at that point at all. No. And no. in a weird sort of way, it kind of, Plants a seed that sinister statue, but we don't know anything about it because it's it, it's irrelevant really before we yeah. see the whole ghost situation. So I quite like that at the start, and also it, I think it's quite a sharp change from sinister to comedy very very quickly back and forth, and that's one of the things that keeps it really going. The tempo they do that in you know in the saving the day scene. So the saving the you know all the crap the the the, the public are just lying in the streets. They come along in Ecto One, and it's do. Um, yeah, doom doomed, doom doomed, doom doomed, doom doomed, doom doomed. Yeah, I see the danger signs. Doom doomed, and they get out and they're looking up at the building, and then it segues from saving the day into that sinister music again as a bit the building falls away and the ground and all the Ghostbusters disappear, and it's like, all right, end of the movie, great, and then but they all climb out like someone goes, oh, they're alive, and then. As soon as they get back out again, it goes back into yeah. saving the day. So, so it's kind yeah. of it's kind of this like scene in scene. It's got the saving the day scene with the sinister bit in the bit in the middle, and the yeah, yeah. it's just it's funny how the music really, they go back into there's the a really song. abrupt cut. There's a really abrupt yeah. cut back to the do 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 yeah, yeah when they're yeah. yeah. going up the stairs. Yeah, but they exactly. do those abrupt really. cuts. You know, you notice it in the first library scene. So they, it's the first time they use the bus boys cleaning up the town. When they come running yeah. out of the uh, the public library, and then it just it cuts to I don't know where Egon's gone, but it's Ray and um, Venkman talking, isn't it about about what they should do next? So they they only use the first couple of bars in it in that bit, but it's a really abrupt cut, like you're saying, Dave. But it so works there's, quite there's well. A couple of bits that have always really stuck out in my mind um, when I watch it, and I've I've always wondered whether it was intentional uh, in terms of the, the the music and the audio editing, whether it's just a, a complete lucky coincidence and you, i don't know if you ever noticed this or not so there's a couple of bits where venkman's dialogue 
the way he does it rhythmically, it's actually in time in the music. So one of the bits is when they first yeah. get out of the car, when saving the day is on, and he goes, I've got to run, I've got a date with a ghost. And it's completely in time, the <laughs> tune, and it yeah. sounds so cool. Uh, and then the other bit, I suppose, is uh, when they come out, when they've just arranged that that mortgage on 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 Ray's family house, and the yeah. he says, "Call it fate, call it but luck." But it's call like it the, yeah, the music it, swells in time. It's really, but, really cool. But it does, and it, in the first couple of lines, he says it's the same key as well. So I think oh. I think that was put in afterwards. To me, I think he's come out and said it sort of rhythmically, um, yeah. and and then Elmer's basically put a bit of. Something Ooh, to first name to lift it up. Yeah, you know, me and Alma. You know, you know that, that you know <laughs> yeah. that scene. It's wabbit season. They call it fate, call it luck, call it karma. I believe that everything happens for a reason. <laughs> you know that scene where he, he's there uh, like lying lying down saying, you know, Einstein did his best work as a patent clerk. A patent clerk? Yeah. You know how much a patent clerk earns? And he goes, goes, no! Yeah, and I love that, because it's like he's made a point, and he goes, but you know how much a patent clerk earns? He's like, no, that's not a bit of information I need to know. And (laughs) And they're just just passing that whisk, that little bottle of whiskey between them. Yeah, but but it cuts back to Dan Aykroyd, um, and he says something, and I just think a little bit of the the movie Trading Places, because he says, you know, I've worked in the public sector. They expect results kind of thing. (laughs) And it doesn't fit, really, with... His sort of goofiness, but it's kind of like that fear. All three of them are you know, meant to be in their mid to late thirties. They're meant to be students, aren't they? That don't really actually want to go out in the big wide world. They want to carry on. They want to be perpetual students forever. Especially Venkman, he just wants to kind of bumble along and get the the grants and and carry on doing this useless work just to to pull women. And, and I, just, I think that's great. I've just read the Venkman line in terms of pulling women. Oh. When he's when he's in Dana's flat, and she gets possessed, and he, he knows she's possessed, so he's like he's not after anything. And then she's like on the bed, or whatever, and he goes like, yeah. "It's a rule that I don't don't get involved with clients." And then she jumps on top of him. And he goes, "More, more, it's more of a guideline." Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's another bit where like literally at the same time he says something, doesn't he? He goes, "No, yes," <laughs> kind of like really quickly. Yeah. Kind of changes yeah. it. He goes, eh, "Yes." <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. I love this city. <laughs> I love this town. <laughs> <laughs> I love this town. <laughs> Jeez, Dave's done that. Dave's got us out. He's caught us out like about seven or eight times tonight. We need to get him back on this. Next time. When you do, this is when you only drink coffee, so I'm drinking coffee. I, I'd get it wrong regardless of what I was drinking. <laughs> Did do you know go, going back to the I love this town moment though? Don't you think mm. that weirdly that's one of the things that doesn't that one of the few things that doesn't kind of work in the movie? It doesn't fit that he says that when he says it. Yeah, it, it just seems like they needed a climax that kind of celeb actual celebratory moment, yeah. but you could have said anything really at that point. Yeah. But it is a celebration it sort of in feels... New York, I think, really, the movie. But I quite like when Lewis comes out of the 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 statue. You know, they unpick him. You know, check on the little guy, the other guy, and they, they unpick him. And he's sort of like weirded out. and said, like, "Who are you guys?" And he's like, "We're, we're Ghostbusters." He goes, I "Okay." Turn the lights on. Turn but, then light. he, but then he, but then but then he goes, "Who does your taxes?" <laughs> it's like straight away he's wanting he's wanting to do some work. Yeah. That's it. When when they all come out the bot at the uh, the bottom of the uh, Shandor building, and it's rolling into the end credits. Yeah. And all the Ghostbusters are there, and it's like, yeah, and all the accolade, and Dane is even with them, and um, and then Lewis comes out, and he's like, "Does anybody want to interview me?" And then the red <laughs> cross, no, the amb- the paramedics come up, put a blanket yeah. around him. He's like, "No, no, I- I'm with. I want to go with them. I want to go with them." <laughs> and they take him off into the ambulance. The poor fella. Yeah, the, the woman just looks at him and goes, "No, no." It's like I'm just <laughs> part of this. I'm part of this. It's like, no, no, no. You're a casualty. Yeah. You're just like one of the other people who were injured. <laughs> And then that last scene, Dave and I were talking about this earlier, where um, they all get into the Ecto-1, Bar Lewis, Tully. Yeah. So Dane is anywhere with the four Ghostbusters. And um, actually, we get Dan Aykroyd getting in. All these extras around, all the public are let past the barriers. And Dan Aykroyd's reversing this old hearse <laughs> into like the doing a three-point turn. It was him, though. You wouldn't get that in movies these days. You'd have a, it, it basically yeah. be the Ghostbusters getting in, 
either cut to credits or a distant shot and it's someone else driving it out. But Dan Aykroyd's like looking out the window, reversing all these people, turning the Ecto-1 around and driving it off. It's brilliant. It just made it feel authentic. It was really good. I I think the stuff, the, the, the end scenes, just because they are really, they are authentic. Aren't they really? That 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 different that different shot, the different camera angle, the different filter, all of it completely different for the end scene works quite well because it creates this sort of thematic ending, doesn't it? And the sort of celebration, like you were saying before, Dave. It's that kind of mm-hmm. celebration of the end of the movie. It it's it's like they've decided to go Panavision rather than normal normal cinema. And um Did you know it, uh... it just creates something did you notice the doorman from um, Dana's building, from the Chandler building? He's as a Ghostbusters yeah. get back in. He closes the door for Ray, so Ray yeah. gets into the door. He still does the door. He still does the door. He's dishevelled. He's, he's covered by the destroyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah. just yeah. And he's like he sort of nods him and smiles at him and closes the door for him. It's like it's a, that's yeah. a really nice touch as well. So this is the part of the show where we review uh, the film that we've been talking about. There are two ratings that we use on the Great Movie Show. We use a popcorn rating out of 10 and that's normally a personal viewpoint how we view the film ourselves how much we'd watch it how much we enjoy it it might not necessarily be indicative of how good the film is from a critical perspective and we also have a five star rating from a critical perspective where we recognize how good that film is when set against lots of other films so with those two ratings in mind i'll first start with dave dave what popcorn rating would you give to ghostbusters 1984 or messing around this week. Just going to go straight for it and giving it a 10 out of 10. It's got to be. Awesome. If there's any movie worthy of, wow. worthy of 10 for me, then this is it. So, not even going to justify awesome. it. Awesome. Just accept it. Um, and maybe we'll hold back on your critics rating then. Lloyd, what would you give as your popcorn rating for Ghostbusters? Do you know what? I It would have been 10 from memory, but because I've watched it recently, um, oh. No, I just I couldn't. I didn't enjoy it as much. I think I was watching it not too critically, like not for the show. I think I was just watching it with my forty-two-year-old brain on me, and I just didn't like Venkman, and it took a little bit away from it because I was I don't know. So, it, but it's still high. It's it's a nine popcorn rating from me. Okay, I think a ten. I think a ten-year-old me would have been ten. My age now, I think it's just lost a little bit. And the special effects as well, it, uh, you know, they're so dated now, some of them. Um, so it's a nine. So I lost one popcorn kernel. I feel responsible. Well, I've, I've, I've sort of gone the other way. I, I was thinking of it as maybe uh, an eight out of ten. You've gone to 11. And... You've gone the other way. <laughs> <laughs> this is Spinal Tap. I, uh, I went for uh, an eight at first, but then when I was thinking about the, the scoring, all I could hear in the... the uh, in my head was that bump down, dude, bump down, <laughs> and suddenly I was thinking, do you know what? I enjoy this one more than that. I, I mm-hmm. you know, there's something about that mm-hmm. film that, um, yeah, I want to give it a nine. So I've rather than go from a ten and bringing it down, I've gone from an eight and taken it up. So I'm also a nine popcorn rating. Um, so Dave, we're now looking at the critics' rating. So this, when you're a little bit more critical of it as a film within the uh, the confines of comparing with classics any other movie what would you say out of five stars that you'd give ghostbusters well i still think it's an amazing movie i think obviously the special effects have dated a bit i don't think the humor has dated i don't think it will date now to be honest i think the humor stands up um it's well you know a lot of it is just funny little quips asides even just looks and stuff like that um obviously yeah the special effects could drag it down, but I'm gonna I'm gonna mark it in 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 context of of, of when it was released. Obviously, I've got a lot of love for it as well, which shouldn't be part of this one. Granted, um, I'm gonna give it a four and a half out of five, which is possibly wow. a little bit a little bit charitable. It's somewhere between a four and, and a four and a half, I think. So I'm gonna okay. We'll go with. We'll go with four and a half because we can't do four and a yeah, quarter. Right, right, right. <laughs> Lloyd, what, Lloyd, what would um, you like to? Same sort of sentiments as Dave, um, but you know, critics rating. You're looking at it critically as a film, uh, what it set out to achieve, and and what it is as 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 a piece of work. So, it's a four from me. Um, 
I think at the time, yes, the special effects were as good as they were going to be. I think they could have been a little bit better. And as Dave said, that you know, they just went for the first shot of some of the special effects because of the time frame. Um, it's a comedy. It's it's not even a supernatural comedy, is it? Really, goes to kind of just like the, the subplot. Really, it's you know, it's three three amigos, um, you know, quipping and making jokes and and getting through the the plot of the movie together with a lot of laughs along the way. So it does what it's set out to achieve. Um, yeah, four star critics rating. Four star. I'm I'm quite impressed that during your commentary then that you've uh, referenced the Three Amigos, which is a. Uh, a film yeah. we could probably talk about. <laughs> My <laughs> little bird of cup. <laughs> over here. Oh, look up. Oh, look up. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. Over here. Over My here. critics rating is a little bit lower than your your both your respective ratings. I think it's a, a really good film. It's something that I enjoy putting on over and over again. Um, I think that the problem with comedies um, generally tends to be that they don't get the same recognition as being great films as perhaps dramas or thrillers and for that reason i'm bringing the rating down a little bit so for ghostbusters i am giving three and a half stars <gasps> three and a half okay so that is uh, the end of our ratings um some controversial ratings amongst us it seems um at the great movie show we always expect there to be high uh, popcorn and critics ratings uh, so we never expect to see lower than three stars, I suppose. Um, Ghostbusters is still a brilliant film uh, and one definitely that everybody should consider watching if you haven't already done so. Okay, so one of the features we also have uh, on the Great Movie Show is the Six Degrees of Separation type um, link. It's uh, an opportunity to move from the previous film that we reviewed. So on this occasion, it's Jaws, and we're moving through actors that are synonymous with Jaws and another film and trying to link from Jaws in approximately six films or any particular theme we think is useful, funny, important or otherwise to the film that we're currently reviewing, which is Ghostbusters. Um, if I can maybe ask Lloyd to start, what is your six degrees of Kevin Bacon for this week? So I had no theme. Um, but my intention this week was to watch Blue Thunder, but I couldn't find it on any of my providers for free. It's like Dave's problem every time we choose a movie because he, yeah. he doesn't if he doesn't own it on Blu-ray, he can't like watch it anywhere for free. So I couldn't watch it for free anywhere. So I watched a few trailers on um, on YouTube of Blue Thunder, and I noticed a very young Daniel Stern in Blue Thunder. Right. Okay. So we've got Roy Scheider from Jaws to Blue Thunder with Daniel Stern. Then I thought, right, I've got. I've lost my link. I've lost my theme in the first movie, but then I'll go to like <laughs> movies of my childhood because I've never th seen Blue Thunder. So I thought I've obviously seen Home Alone. So Daniel Stern, yeah. Home Alone. So that was my next yeah. link. So I was thinking about that. Then I was thinking, so comedy, all in that sort of. They move in the same circles. So it was like John Candy is in Home yeah. Alone. Obviously, I forget the name of the band. He, he's playing the um, tuba or something, isn't he? In yeah, the, yeah. But he's also that. in. He's also in Un Uncle Buck with Macaulay Culkin. So yeah. He's also in Home yeah. Alone with Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> I just mean as a, a second, what's, a what's, second your point? Link? what's your point, Adam? <laughs> He's got a lot of hair, hair you know. Remember our Thanks for noticing. Polka, 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 polka. He's in a polka <laughs> band, isn't he? Um, <laughs> Do that again. Oh. Polka, polka, polka. <laughs> and what was the other one? I, you don't remember our other hit? It was like Polka Blues or something. Um, <laughs> so was it, anyway, he's in Home Alone with John Candy. Then I was thinking, right. I've got like a straight link to Ghostbusters now. And it was like another like film of our childhood. So it's The Great Outdoors, John Candy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Dan Aykroyd um, with, um, what's the bear called? It was a bear. I think the bear's even got a name. It was like Billy the Bear or something. It was a bear they used in all the movies at the time. What's it called, Dave? No, oh, I haven't seen that movie. It's on <laughs> all right. What do you put your hand up for? Why do you put your hand up? <laughs> that would be funny. So there's a bear um, in that, and that was basically, I, th I think it might have played Gentle Ben at some point or with uh, Ron Howard's brother or something like that. But anyway, the bear was a famous bear as well. But anyway, John Candy and Dan Aykroyd in The Great Outdoors, moved from our childhood. Dan Aykroyd, obviously, in Ghostbusters, which is the film we are talking about this evening. I like Dawn. it. Dave, Dave, what is your 
six degrees. I know you were trying to complicate things and then you decided to relent um, and, and do something a little different. What, which way have you gone? Yeah, I always start off with these fantastic notions of having a theme or something, but it generally falls apart fairly Dave's quickly. doing Quentin Tarantino movies again tonight. And then <laughs> Every week I'm just going to do Quentin Tarantino. Can't do it. Can't yeah, do every it. Week, every week it's the hateful eight, yeah. Um, no, so, I mean, I thought, for me, this, this was relatively clever because, you know, by my standards. Um, okay. So, in Jaws, you mentioned that the, I think it's the Amity Coast Guard, um, the voiceover, so it doesn't physically appear in the movie, but the voiceover yeah. of the Amity Coast Guard is actually Steven Spielberg. Yeah. yeah. Steven Spielberg uh, uh, appears in a cameo role in the Blues Brothers, which yeah. also stars Dan Aykroyd in this yeah. week's movie, Ghostbusters. <laughs> I like it. I like there it. I'm go. quite impressed. Although I do feel like both of you have gone for the very short version of this particular <laughs> segment. So I'm really glad that I'm doing a lengthy version. <laughs> So we do know, don't we, that the quickest link between them is the classic comedy, What About Bob? I know it because I Googled yeah, it. Yeah, Bill Murray, yeah. Is it? Is that a good movie? I've never heard of it before. It's, it's all right. It's a Bill Murray movie, so it's always yeah. pretty impressive. But yeah, him, yeah. As, him and Richard Dreyfuss um, mm -hmm. are um, good links. Um, but that's not what I was going for. Um, you'll be unsurprised to know I've decided to try and make it as complicated as possible. I am aware that whilst we're filming this, we're only within a few days of the Oscars. Yeah. So I was thinking of Oscar links, and it's pretty tricky, um, but I've gone for this. So I'll try not to look at any notes so you know that I genuinely have thought mm -hmm. about this. So Richard Dreyfuss yeah, won an after Oscar. After he Googled it for the whole week and like, wrote <laughs> extensive notes and remembered them. You know, you know all of these films. Anyway, this isn't difficult. The, uh, I don't know who's won an Oscar for like best. You will do. You'll in a scene. Okay, I would say that out of these, there might be two films that you don't realize somebody's won an Oscar for. But I reckon you will know the rest. So okay. they well, aren't. They aren't. Goog they're easily googled, but you don't need to Google to get them. So the one that you might not know is Richard Dreyfuss uh, was in the Goodbye Girl, and he won an Oscar for that. He starred in Always, which was another Spielberg film yeah. that he starred in with Holly Hunter. And Holly yeah. Hunter won Best Actress Oscar in The Piano. Um, also in The Piano um, was a very young Anna Paquin. Oh, I think you say and she won, she won the Best Supporting Actress, as it was then, uh, Oscar. I think she was maybe 10 or 11 or something like that. I think she was the youngest, possibly the youngest actor ever to win it at that point. How do you know these She's, things? Because I, I, I'm just a bit of a movie geek. So she um, was in the less um, Oscar-worthy film, uh, X-Men Days of Futures Past. Uh, it might have got a visual effects Oscar, but didn't get anything noteworthy. Um, she was in that uh, with Dave's uh, favorite, Jennifer Lawrence. And Jennifer Lawrence won an Oscar for Silver Linings Playbook. Jennifer Lawrence was in Red Sparrow with Jeremy Irons. Jeremy Irons won an Oscar for Reversal of Fortune some time ago. That might be one that you wouldn't know, naturally. Are you counting the number of moves here, Lloyd? Have we got an infringement? No, so just... um, he, was, he was in uh, The Man in the Iron Mask, which also starred Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio. Really? Uh, sorry? Did that win an Oscar for something? No. It's about the actors, the actors who've won Oscars. Leonardo oh, okay. DiCaprio, Leon, Leonardo, think of the theme. Leonardo DiCaprio um, won an Oscar quite recently for um, The Revenant. So he's an Oscar winner. But he also starred in Oscar winning The Aviator, which starred Oscar winner Kate Blanchett. She won an Oscar for her role in that movie. And Kate Blanchett was in Life Aquatic with Bill Murray. And this is the only thing that falls down in my list. Bill Murray was nominated for an Oscar for Lost in Translation and really should have won, but did not. And he's in Ghostbusters. So my link from Jaws to Ghostbusters via Oscars almost made it. Unfortunately, no Oscar winning at all for Ghostbusters. So I fell at the last herd. 
And that concludes 27 Degrees. <laughs> So this is one of our final segments. This is Pop Quiz Hot Shot. Um, for the previous three episodes, you've delved uh, a little into the lives and thought processes of all three of us as hosts. Uh, we consider it might perhaps be boring for us to set ourselves the same questions week after week after week. I understand that Dave in a moment will um, ask us a question that he is aware of that one of the viewers has posed for us. And the viewer. So the viewer, the, viewer, for the single viewer. And um, so I'll hand it over to Dave. You ask the question and then perhaps Lloyd, you can answer, then I'll answer. And then Dave can answer the same question. Okay. So this week's question comes from Kaylin Cool 91 who commented on the last episode, the Jaws episode, asking us, what is your favourite quote of all time from a movie or a show? Lloyd. So my line is from one of my, well, probably my favourite movie, which may not make the show. Um, I don't think it's revered by um, the, the critic world of, of movies, although I, I love it to, to death, this movie. It's directed by Cameron Crowe. It's Vanilla Sky. Um, and as the plot is unravelling towards the end and the, uh, the viewer is getting a glimpse into what is actually happening, Tom Cruise meets his, his beau, his, his love of the movie on top of this rooftop. Um, we now know that it's not quite real. Uh, and he sort of just states to her, it's like he, he sees her on top of the roof. He knows what's going on. He knows she's not really there. He's loved her. And it's it's a love of his life. It's his soulmate. And he sort of says, well, look at us. Uh, I'm frozen and you're dead. And then he pauses for a second and he goes, and I love you. And it just, uh, do you know what? It's, it's choking me up now <laughs> saying that line. It's just, it's a beautiful moment. He's, you know, I won't spoil the movie, but he, yeah, she's long dead and he's frozen, but he's seen her right there. And then, and he said, he says, that line, you know, look at us now. I'm frozen and you're dead and I love you. And then she just comes back and she goes in a, a lovely, like sort of Catalonian accent. She goes, that's a problem. <laughs> and it's just, it's a lovely little moment. It's, it's my favourite. It's my absolute favourite. Although my other favourite is in, um, oh, um, Van Damme with his brother. He plays himself twice. Double, Double impact. impact. Double Uncle impact. Frankie. No, Uncle Frankie. Uncle Frankie. <laughs> no it's, it's at the beginning. Did I get the like, splits? No yeah. problem. Because <laughs> of my big legs and my karate, I can do the splits. No problem. <laughs> that is an awesome There's a few line. of the lines from that film which are awesome. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. <laughs> That's a brilliant. Huge surprise. <laughs> it's just great for quotes, that movie. So for comedy or like quotable quotes, it's that. But no, for my favourite quote ever, it's, uh, it's, it's that one. And there's lovely lines either side of that bit in Vanilla Sky. She's talking about we should come back and we will be cats and that sort of thing. But it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely. We're both cats. Yeah, and it's just it's just fantastic. It's like I I lost you the moment I got into that car, and I'm sorry like that. He's, but he knows she's not there. It's like what I say to you, Adam. Like never going for coffee because yes. no matter what happens, it's not a good thread. Never a good thread. I am. Um, um, I'm. I quite. Yeah. I I quite like the the other one. You know the um. You got to taste the bitter. Well, the sweet, yeah, the sour. So sweet. yeah, sweet, sour. sour. You got to taste so sweet, sweet without the sour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a that's a, a nice sort of like understated one. Maybe um, we can do the movie on this on this show then, if you two are willing to do it. I yeah. don't know. Well, fans, I don't like, think you'd last. It sounds like you'd be crying your eyes out for an hour and a half. I would do. <laughs> I watched that scene. It just it just bre it breaks me down. And you have got the music I, in the background. You've got the amazing Cameron Crowe picks amazing songs for his films. Amazing songs. And um, you've got, ah, it's just, it's crazy. Um, you hear this lovely sound in the background. Well, you guys might not be surprised too much to know what um, my favorite quotable film lines um, are, because you know how much I like Aaron. I carried, a, I carried a watermelon. <laughs> you know how much watermelon? I like. You, you'll know, especially Lloyd, uh, how I, I I'm a, a 
you know, I really, really like the West Wing. I love Aaron yeah, Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin, it's just, it's, it's, he's amazing. I think he's sort of like the, the you know, an alternate version of David Mamet with all of his, you know, um, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, 12 Angry Men type plays. Aaron Sorkin tends to have a good way of running the, the the structure of any particular sequence by dialogue. Everything's run by dialogue. The walk and talk on, on West Wing, you know, it's, it's, it's famous and squeezing all of the dialogue quickly into particular scenes is something that I, I'm always particularly impressed with. So um, it's a Rob Reiner film, um, which um, Aaron Sorkin wrote, I think the screenplay as well as the story, but um, it's A Few Good Men. And uh, Jack Nicholson has so many quotes um, in there that are, are useful. Uh, and, Don't do, you can't handle you know, the truth. You've impressive. Got one, I, I have. So um, Good. One, what, one I like, obviously, is, you know, um, I... You want answers, I want answers. You want answers, I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. And it's the remainder oh, yeah. of that. You know, you both, you, yes. you know, you, yeah. you know, you need me, you want me on that wall, you need me on that wall. You know, all of that part of it is is actually the, the more impressive part. Um, I like the fact he says when they're, they're wearing their whites, when they shouldn't be, they should be wearing their camo when they first meet him um, over, I think, in um, Guantanamo Bay. And he sort of says, but first you've got to ask me nicely. And it just sort of that cuts through everything. Um, so Jeff, Jeff, and it's Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, Good Jeff time. Goldblum. It's my Jeff Goldblum impression again. And he's got so, he's got so many lines in that that are really really good. But actually, I would say my favourite line from that movie comes from Tom Cruise when he's talking to Demi Moore, and um, she's sort of pushing his buttons, really, sort of saying, you know, I think you know where we're going to end up here. You know, you know, we've got a case and he says, you know, you and Sam both live in a dream world. It doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what I can prove. So don't tell me what I know and don't know. I know the law. That to me was just, that's the movie. That's all, all that it is. Yeah. We know the it games. Is. We yeah, know what we know. Yeah. we know. Yeah. And, and, and it moves straight from that act to the next act of the movie. So, and that, that, and that my... poor guy, one of the soldiers who gets a dis all he wants to be is like honorably discharged or keep some sort of status in the army. And he gets dishonorably yeah. discharged at the end. He's like, he's, he's, he, he's, his intellect isn't as high as other people's, is he? And he's like, what's yeah. happening? What's happening? What does that what does that mean? What does that mean? That like yeah. that really hits me every time I watch it. He's done something yeah. bad, but it was on orders. And he's like, I joined the army to follow orders. I've been given orders. Why am I getting dishonorably discharged? It's yeah. really, really sad that. Yeah, so yeah, many quotable lines from that movie, but um, yeah, that would be my probably my favourite line. There's many, many, many lines, but Dave, no, oh, Dave. Okay, well, it's, 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 in the, it's a hateful eight, and uh... with, with, with my answer, I get to prove what a shallow idiot I actually am. <laughs> so you two, you, you two, give answers that, that were both, you know, quite meaningful, really, uh, quite quite weighty. Um, whereas I'm just going to say that although I don't. I, I would never profess to have a favourite movie. Uh, one of my favourite movies, uh, and the reason it is, it's there with Ghostbusters for being one of the most quotable movies ever. Are you so going to say, be... you, is your favourite line Sam Jackson, Samuel L. Jackson? No, Lloyd. I, I'm not going to be that guy. I thought it was going to be for Pulp Fiction. I'm not going to do Ezekiel 25, 17 from start to finish. I, I think <laughs> that I... a righteous man. I think that Dave was... If he hasn't chosen it, I reckon he's he was really close to choosing a particular line from With Nail. So yeah, you, With Nail's <laughs> a movie, and I'm not going to commit to a single a single line because there's so I many in that so. movie. That's yeah. just cheating. You're so good. Sorry, that's just cheating. We've gone on holiday <laughs> by mistake. Say one. <laughs> are, are you the farmer? Stop. What about my wife? That one. My wife is having a baby. If you hit me, it's murder. That, that's that, that, that's, that's, that's my favorite. <laughs> just so many. Obviously, yeah, I'm not. So I'm not going to differentiate. The movie's with now. Choose, choose, choose one. Um, I don't know if the person that submitted the uh, the question is old enough to watch it. So if not, I apologize. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a couple of more recent movies that spring to mind uh, with regards to, to quotes. And again, it, it is funny. It's nothing. Unfortunately, it's nothing really meaningful, but. There's one um, that always cracks me up, and his, his delivery is amazing. He's deadpan, 
uh, it's, is it's, it's get Kirsty in. No, no. <laughs> Wait, I'll, two, okay, two. Can I have two more? Sorry. So basically, anything that Korg says in Thor Ragnarok, and I'm sure Adam will do yeah. a, a wonderful impression. Hey, man. Hey, man. <laughs> it's just a couple of rocks talking to you. <laughs> Nothing to be worried about. Except, of course, if you made of scissors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Korg. But the one, the, the one, the one that cracks, and, and apparently ad libbed it on set is um, Drax with the, um, you know, where is Gamora? <laughs> Why is Gamora? <laughs> no. no, he says, where, where, Gamora? where is Gamora? What is it? Say? Who where is Gamora? Gamora? Yeah, then where who is Gamora? Gamora? Who's Gamora? Why is Gamora? I'll do you one better. Why is yeah. Gamora? <laughs> Absolutely Plus, brilliant. Yeah. So there you go. Oh, my um, my Guardians of the Galaxy 2 poster by Matt Ferguson, signed Artist Proof, is on its way now. Excellent. And I think it's got a layer of um, glow-in-the-dark ink on it, so you can see basically little images from it when you turn off the lights. Like, in fact... Oh, Lloyd, you've got glow-in-the-dark. Uh, that's cool. He can't, even make it, he can't even make it onto the T-shirt. Give the guy a break. He wasn't in the <laughs> Columbia University Paranormal Studies Department. What's the name of the um, game player who plays uh, against Korg on the Xbox? Uh, New Master 69. Is it? He, yeah. He's, he's going to appear in um, God of Thunder. God of... Yeah. What's it called? Love and Thunder. Thor Love yeah, and Thunder. He's, 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 a fam he's a famous character in the Marvel series, isn't he? Okay, so that is the end of our show. We've enjoyed uh, talking about Ghostbusters this week and all related uh, matters. Um, if you're listening to us on the podcast, please be aware that we have got a YouTube channel. We also appear on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you can please on YouTube, like and subscribe. We've got a single troll, it seems, at the moment that is <laughs> hellbent on putting thumbs down at every opportunity. So There's a troll like in it, the dungeon! There's a troll <laughs> in the dungeon! Don't feed the troll! Don't feed the troll! So please, at any opportunity, if you like what you're watching, please just put the thumbs up. It would be really appreciated. Um, I've been Adam, your host for this evening. I also want to say thank you to Lloyd. Hello. And thank, thank you to Dave. Friends. That's a wrap. <laughs>